professor um, specializing in horticultural crops. He's also written several um, insect identification books and textbooks. Um, but today he's going to talk about a new project he's been working on with industrial hemp, which is important to Kentucky as well as Colorado, and it's becoming important across the country. So let's welcome Dr. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So, kept the lights good. So, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, you letting me come here. I, I actually asked to be in, to, to give this seminar. It's a little tacky, but I've always wanted to come to the University of Kentucky, and um, thank you very much for letting me come here. Anyway, I just thought this would be an interesting topic because um, this is a new crop. There's a lot of interest in in hemp, and. Uh, the two big players in the state in the country are, are Kentucky and Colorado. I think we both have about the same acreage, uh, and I know a lot of people in Colorado also grow in, in Kentucky, and obviously both vice versa. And uh, yeah, if things that happen in Kentucky uh, affect us too, I mean, two days ago this is the front page of the Denver Post, and that's your uh, uh, that's your uh, uh, senator right there. Anyway, so. Um, get into this uh, a little bit. I got to define what what kind of what type of crop is hemp. Um, this is this is it's it's not an easy question because it, it, as you'll find out it's, it's several different crops, and the kinds of insects on the different crops will be different. Um, so basically, uh, what we're talking about are are uh, cultivated crops that are some species of cannabis, and and there are. Uh, generally recognized either three species or three subspecies, depends on what you're talking about, um, that are cultivated cannabis crops, uh, cannabis sativa and also cannabis indica. And a lot of these uh, 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 crops uh, are cultivated for different things. Uh, uh, so I think the best known one, of course, has been uh, cultivating uh, it for psychoactive compounds, THC, uh, marijuana. Uh, but uh, when we're talking about hemp, I think most people think of, of hemp as being a, a fiber uh, crop, as it, as it was. So in the picture in the lower right is, is an historical picture from Kentucky growing it as a fiber crop. And a uh, picture in the upper right is what you buy in a marijuana shop in Colorado, a little bud of uh, marijuana. Um, and in between, we have some other uh, markets for seed, uh, either for uh, edible seed or for oil seed, and uh, for something called CBD, a, a non-psychoactive compound. So the ability to work on hemp uh, became, a, uh, became a possibility with the passage of the 213 or 2014 Farm Bill passed in 2013, signed in 2014. Um, that had a provision in it that, that allowed there to be research done on hemp. It allowed it to be legally grown uh, under certain restrictions uh, where the state laws allow it and uh, where uh, the sites uh, are grown are under the direction of, and regulation of the State Department of Agriculture. Um, and this is what enabled hemp to become finally a crop we could, we could now access and work. I cannot work in marijuana. Uh, most any, anybody who works in a, a, a institution that gets federal money can't work on that. Uh, but hemp we can. And hemp is defined as the uh, plant cannabis sativa and any part of that plant, whether growing or not, with a delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol content of not more than 0.3% on a dry weight basis. So that's, that's how hemp is defined. So, so hemp would be a cultivar of cannabis with low levels uh, of the psychoactive compound THC, 0.3%. Magic number, don't ask why it's 0.3, um, but it is. Except in West Virginia, it's 0.5, so don't ask why. Anyway, um, but, but what types of, of cannabis crops are hemp? Um, so, so there's several, several different kinds of plants the way we grow it. Two, two big ones, uh, two main differences. One would be growing it for this compound or the compounds known as CBD. These would be the non-psychoactive compounds that have pharmaceutical uses. Uh, and uh, uh, this, is a, this is a plant that is actually, this is the type of culture that is the, predominantly what we're growing when we say hemp. This is, I think I saw a, a seminar uh, from somebody from Kentucky State said 60% of the hemp here in this state is, is CBD, hemp grown for CBD. And uh, I'm sure it's at least that in Colorado as well. And if you grow hemp for CBD, what you're trying to get are uh, uh, large buds, uh, the, the female flowers that are uh, resin rich, uh, or maybe also the leaves as well. They have less levels of these compounds. Uh, but usually, you're, you're trying to grow uh, plants with large buds that have lots of resin in it. It is, is a plant that is uh, 
grown from transplants. Most often it is grown from transplants and the parentage is often uh, both indica or uh, uh, indica and sativa. So usually there is some sort of uh, greenhouse culture when, when you're growing this to uh, keep maintain the, the mother plants and then you're taking cuttings and then you're growing it out in the field. And, and the reason they do this in, in part is because then the genetics are stable uh, because if it goes over 0.3%, then bingo, you got crappy marijuana instead of uh, uh, hemp and then you got to destroy the field. So you can't let, you can't be growing anything that's going to go above that magic 0.3% or you destroy the crop. So the, the plant is typically grown by transplants with early season indoor production and uh, in-field plant populations are, are, are often low. They're widely spaced plants. You get a big bushy plant, not particularly tall. And uh, again, that's the kind of the ideal of what you're, you're trying to, that part of the plant is what you're looking for. Um, and then these will be harvested and often uh, these are fairly uh, simply harvested uh, by hand. Uh, in this case, people are just uh, thrown on the back of their tractor and then taken to the shed where they'll then process the compounds out of this. Um, there are some CBD crops that are now being grown from seed. Some people have advanced the genetics well enough so they can get it stable and so that they can, they can seed them. Uh, some of these are uh, looking really interesting. I mean, they, these can be, uh, you can have higher plant populations, you can have much bigger plants. Uh, usually the ones that are grown with, uh, uh, by seed right now have lower levels. They might have, you know, 6% CBD instead of 20% CBD uh, uh, comp, uh, concentration, but you can have huge biomass and you can grow them by seed. Whereas the, the historic kind of uh, hemp would be produced by seeding. The ones we grow for fiber and for seed is produced by seeding, often with very high plant populations. Uh, you might want uh, uh, very high populations that have lots of little small thin plants that you can then harvest and, and uh, get the fibers out of the stalks. Um, the uh, crop um, is uh, usually contains a mixture of males and females. Most of them are dioecious, so you get some male plants that are producing pollen, females that are, are going to produce the seed. Uh, sometimes they've got both on, on the same plant. Pollination is by wind. That being said, um, uh, this uh, is a plant that is extremely uh, attractive to bees in areas where there's no alternate plants uh, for pollen sources. Uh, in our area, where everything is irrigated acreage, there's not a lot of flowering plants providing pollen late in, in August. Hemp is amazing. I mean, everything, all sorts of bees are on it. Um, and I'll come back to that. So basically, I would say hemp is, is maybe, in, in terms of a pest management, insect pest management kind of uh, perspective, it's, it's three crops. It's, it's, a, it's hemp being grown for seed and fiber. In that case, you're growing it outdoors from seed, uh, as, I, as I showed you before. Uh, hemp is grown for CBD production outdoors, uh, usually, occasionally indoors, but usually outdoors. And it may have, again have an indoor phase. And then any indoor culture of any cannabis crop because the pests are going to be different when you grow it in a greenhouse than when you grow it outside. So there hasn't been a lot of work done on, on insects on hemp. I mean, because, uh, well, we haven't been able to grow it legally for, uh, since World War II. Um, so, uh, and, and a lot of things have changed since that time, including how we, how we grow this crop. But the question is uh, uh, that we're, going to be finding out in the next few years. I mean, what kind of arthropods will we find associated with hemp in this new era uh, when we're growing it? So um, we do know, you know, that the, what, what, the, what are the insects that might, we, we might be finding on indoor crops. So, uh, you know, being grown in, marijuana has been grown indoors uh, for longer than we've been growing hemp uh, uh, in recent years or has much more extensive use. So, so indoors uh, in the, the, uh, uh, situations where I viewed, I mean, there's a handful of, of uh, arthropod pests on indoor grown cannabis, be it marijuana or CBD hemp. And these are, uh, some of them are very familiar insects and some of them are novel. So uh, probably the key pest when you grow these crops indoors is the two spotted spider mites on, on everything else. Why not hemp? Uh, uh, but there is one that is specific to hemp uh, called the hemp russet mite. And this is one that really needs attention. This is a areophyte mite, very tiny mite. Um, it causes, uh, feeds on the, the leaves uh, early in the year. Uh, that little leaf roll there is, is a fairly typical kind of early symptom you might see. Uh, causes the leaves to get brittle and then they get on the developing flowers and uh, can greatly reduce uh, yields of, of plants that you're, you're growing for the buds. 
Uh, but again, area five mite, almost zero, none about known about this. Uh, aphids, I, I, you know, the aphid I would always see first was one I had no clue would be on cannabis or anything. I mean, rice root aphid, um, and it develops on the roots of, of cannabis, grows on the roots of rice, it grows on the roots of lots of things. I'd never seen it before. I mean, I, I originally see the adults usually caught on the leaves of the plants, but then the, the larvae, I mean, in that case in the upper right, they're, they're growing in hydroponic culture. I mean, it's in, in, in water and they're still growing there. And they're actually on rice in the picture on the upper left. We grow some rice at, at CSU because, um, because um, anyway, we work, on, we work on diseases of rice that you can't, grow, you can't uh, study if you grow rice because they're so bad. Anyway, but, uh, and, then, and then cannabis aphid. The other aphid is cannabis aphid. That's the only other aphid I've seen on, on indoor grown uh, crops. And uh, I'll come back to this because this is a, a new uh, US record. Uh, of this species. The thrips I see on cannabis is onion thrips, not flower thrips. I find flower thrips outdoors when we get pollen, but indoors on the leaves it's onion thrips. And they're everywhere. You know, it's a ubiquitous insect. And then in the soil, you know, the dark winged fungus gnats, so, you, know, you grow plants in the soil, you always get fungus gnats. And, uh, some of the growers are, are worried about that. I, uh, probably uh, not, not uh, uh, probably not that big a deal, but they, they do worry about, they worry about everything. Um, now, I, I, I've been trying to see what we have on, on this plant, and I've been doing some extension talks, just throwing stuff out and seeing what you know, see how it plays, and see what people say about what I've said. And and you know, one thing that I, I, I mentioned is 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 you know, the pests associated with indoor production will likely have very little overlap with the ones you see outside. You know, the indoor ones indoors, that's a green, those are greenhouse type of insects. You put them outside. Natural enemies come in, or they disperse, and that's true for some things. I mean, I, I, outdoors, I never see two-spotted spider mite yet be an issue, or thrips, you know, to be an issue. Um, but the, you know, because there is a, uh, a robust complex of natural enemies on, on hemp when you grow it out, outside. So let me just talk about that a little bit. I mean, it's it's pretty typical of what you might think of in, in most field crops, at least in our area. Uh, so uh, we have the you know, lady beetles. Uh, six species are fairly common. These would be the big three. Uh, these are you know three lady beetles you find pretty much anywhere in in North America. Um, but we also get uh, uh, parentheses lady beetle, the nine spotted lady beetle, and Ola C. nigrum. Uh, and then the larvae, uh, which um, I just when the, the the larvae are something that you know all the growers. When they see it, they think it's some sort of pest, and so I got to explain. No, that's a that's a lady beetle larva. It's just looking for the last cannabis aphid on that plant. Um, find at least three species of green lace wings well adapted to the the crop: um, a Chrysopa and two Chrysoperla species. Uh, occasionally, we'll find these in the in the plant because they're biting us, like that one on the right. I give you a little nip, um, and. Uh, uh, flower flies uh, haven't uh, got the species level the, the flower flies we've got in the crop, but there's uh, at least four different species of flower flies we found uh, developing on insects in the crop, as well as some other families of predatory flies, uh, empidids, um, and uh, oh no, it's not, um, and uh, adolicopodids. Anyway, a couple other predatory flies, and then some generalist hemipteran predators, uh, uh, damsel bugs, uh, spine soldier bug. Uh, that uh, predatory mirrored in the upper right, and uh, my new pirate bugs. Uh, the probably the most si the single most widespread insect of predator I find in, in fields though is uh, the damsel bug Navis alternatus. It's everywhere. You know, it, that's that's the one insect I can count on in, in any field I, I look at. Spiders, um, I think will probably be uh, quite important in many fields. It kind of depends on when you plant them. If you're transplanting them late or starting them, you know, you could you could be planting them now and have a very early uh, season uh, crop getting established that uh, dispersing spiders could move into early in the year. But it's it's it, the big three families would be saltisids, uh, the tamisids, and the uh, long-jawed spiders, the tetrachnathids, uh, that we find. Now I did say that uh, you know generally I, I say there's likely little overlap between what you're going to see in the greenhouse and, and what you see outside. There's two species which that gives makes a lie out of that. Uh, one is the cannabis aphid, which I was aware of, but more recently, uh, hemp russet mite. That's one that is uh, appears to be much more important uh, outdoors than I had had blithely said it would be, and I'll come back to that. Um, 
But okay, let's let's now talk about the, the, the pests that are or the insects that are feeding on the crop, whether they're pests or not, is a separate issue. Uh, so what kind of arthropods we find feeding on these plants? And uh, there will be some fluid feeding insects, uh, hemipterans, that feed on the leaves, uh, aphids and leaf hoppers, uh, mostly um, tree hoppers, plant hoppers, spittle bugs have all been reported. Um, <coughs> I haven't seen tree hoppers or spittle bugs, but they have been reported elsewhere. Uh, uh, in this, uh, there was a study in Mississippi several years ago on uh, insects and cultivated marijuana, and it included those families as well. But I think the most surprising insect I found was this cannabis aphid. Um, uh, it was uh, one that I had misidentified. I, uh, when I first saw it, I, I thought it was a hop aphid, uh, same genus as the hop aphid. Uh, and there was some literature that said hop aphids on cannabis. I, I think that was a misidentification. I, I don't think hop aphid goes to cannabis. We'll ch double check that this year. But uh, 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 it uh, is uh, an insect that's well known to attack uh, cannabis crops in, in uh, Europe and in Asia. And uh, uh, it just hadn't been recognized in the United States. But turns out it's everywhere. I, we have records from it from Virginia. Ontario, Minnesota, Oregon, Colorado. You know, as soon as we start looking, it's everywhere. It's probably been moved around for years on indoor cultures. Uh, but uh, and, I mean, it's a, it's kind of a, a this is what it, uh, they might look like in uh, late in the season. A couple of them you can see fungus killed, but anyway, pretty variable. Um, sorry, not these, some of these aren't the greatest videos, but at least there's, it's a little more real. Anyway. Um, now, how damaging is it in the field? I mean, I, 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 in three of the 12 fields that I was regularly visiting last summer, uh, I, I saw populations develop like that. That's pretty high. Uh, it lasted pretty high uh, in, for maybe three weeks or so and then crashed. Uh, and you know, again, numerous natural enemies started just uh, uh, devastating them. And, and I didn't see any obvious damage from cannabis aphids. I mean, these are, these are irrigated crops. They get plenty of moisture, had three week uh, period when they had lots of aphids and then it went away on its own. So I, I don't know uh, how, how damaging uh, this one's going to be. Uh, certainly in the absence of natural enemies, they, they could be uh, quite bad. And in indoor pr production, that's the separate situation. We'll have to consider introducing natural enemies for them. But um, uh, cannabis aphid uh, is reportedly uh, only uh, is, is specific on cannabis species. Um, and it does produce eggs. It's a holocyclic monoecious uh, on, on cannabis, we think. Uh, that's what the literature says. And, and we did see sexual forms, and these are not them, but did see sexual forms being produced uh, beginning late in September and into October. So uh, eggs are going to be the overwintering stage uh, laid on, on stems, on the heads, uh, different parts of the plant. Now this plant dies at the end of the year. So. Um, the question comes up, you know, how will cannabis aphids survive between seasons in place with hard freezing winters, like where I live, and, and you, you get you get cold. Well, we, we get we get more cold, but you get cold. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, I, I think what we're seeing in Colorado is almost all indoor being sustained on indoor crops and then being moved out on these transplants. And and all the three, I, I, I found it. I found cannabis aphid in every field I looked at. So. They can disperse over time over a pretty wide area in five counties or so. But um, the, uh, 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 the the heaviest infestations were all people who were who were, uh, had indoor culture and, and started the fields from transplants. But you know, theoretically, um, you know, I mean, how it would survive in 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 the real world would be uh, as eggs on the old crop debris, and then new new seedlings come up the next spring, and then the eggs hatch, and some of them are able to move to the new seedlings. So. Um, the situation in, in Virginia uh, probably was uh, feral hemp. It, it was surviving on feral hemp. Um, and when we get uh, crops, uh, if we're growing it for, for a seed crop, uh, 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 now there's often a lot of shattered seed that drops on the ground and a lot of volunteers the next year. And if we have that situation, either feral hemp or a lot of volunteers growing up in the fields, then I can see us having a situation where this insect could survive outdoors between seasons moving from the old uh, crop debris, but uh, uh, into, the, into the new, new uh, crop the next year. Um, but still got to learn a few more things about that. Leaf hoppers, I don't know, 
five, six leaf species of leafhoppers we found. I haven't identified any of them, but at least three of them are breeding on hemp that I see. Frankly, none of the ones I see in Colorado, I think, are any, any, anything to worry about at all. They're for feeding on the phloem, taking out a little sap, or we have a few of the ones that feed in uh, parenchyma cells and make little stippling spots and stuff. Uh, big, big whoop. Um, but uh, I don't know, it might be different out here. I mean, you've got the potato leaf hopper. We don't have a potato leaf hopper. Potato leaf hopper, that's, that's, that's a tough leaf hopper. That, that does serious damage to many crops. And uh, it is known to damage hops, which by the way, is, I guess I should have said, is, is very closely related to uh, uh, cannabis. Um, so perhaps uh, potato leaf hopper could be an issue you'll have that I won't have uh, when you grow it out here. Uh, most obvious to a typical grower would be things that chew on the leaves because they tend to be bigger and you see the leaves disappearing and they, they don't notice a leaf hopper, but uh, they would notice a big caterpillar or grasshopper or something. And um, at least nine species so far uh, feeding on uh, casperoles, feeding, feeding on leaves of the plant. Um, the uh, Probably the, the ones that are, are most uh, regularly seen are uh, late season woolly bears, either the salt marsh caterpillar or the yellow woolly bear, which yellow woolly bear feeds on everything late in the season. Uh, and you, you have that, uh, you have both of these. Uh, the, the other one that I, I'd see quite common that I'd, I'd never seen very much before in any other veg crop I'd worked on was zebra caterpillar, which is such a pretty caterpillar. Um, but I think it's mostly feeding on the flowers uh, anyway, but pretty, pretty common. What are you going to have here? Uh, probably many of those as well, but you've got uh, you know, that yellow uh, yellow striped army worm. Those are these two pictures from Kentucky. Um, those would uh, probably be more, be more important. Yellow striped army worms kind of just we're at the far western edge of the range of that insect, and you're more right in the middle of it. And then uh, that's, I don't know what that is. Does anybody know what the cat is? That a, is that one of the commas? Is that like the eastern comma? Uh, anyway, that's some um, nymphalid. Uh, leaf feeding beetles, yeah, we got a few beetles. You know, we got some flea beetles that chew in little holes in the leaves and every, you know, every, southern corn rootworm, uh, spotted cucumber beetle, that feeds on everything and yeah, we've got that. Um, what's gonna be like in Kentucky? Well, you got, you got the Japanese beetle. You know, you're gonna see Japanese beetle um, on, on your crop. Uh, and I think I, I've got uh, pictures that indicated they really like the flowers, if you get flowering, but uh, Anyway, so you'll have, ja you'll have Japanese beetles and we won't have Japanese beetles. Yeah, but, and grasshoppers, well, where I live, grasshoppers are, are, are more important. In the West, grasshoppers rule. I mean, if they're, uh, they're, we get uh, very high populations in, in many agricultural areas uh, episodically. At least three species are, are regularly found in hemp. Uh, differential grasshopper and two-stripe grasshopper, ubiquitous species, you've got them too. Uh, are the most common ones. The, the damage that they do is a little more in, injurious because grasshoppers will not only chew on the leaves, but they'll like hang out on the stems and just gnaw, just for the heck of it. They just gnaw and then the plant falls over. Uh, so you get, you'll get uh, um, uh, leaves, uh, uh, branches uh, breaking and wilting. So how, Im how important are all these defoliators? I don't know, I, hemp is a tough plant. I mean, I, the, the the, the thing I saw this summer that made me think that, you know, it could probably respond to defoliation pretty well is, is seeing how a field responded to a, a, a really severe hail event. We had a, a serious hail event in this field and across the field, as I was talking about this at lunch, across the field was a melon field. And, and after this hail storm, the melon field, I mean, the biggest plant piece of melon you could find was like that big. I mean, it was, it was turned into salad nuggets. Um, there was nothing left, but this, yeah, he got beat up, got some broken branches. I mean, heck, it's, it's made of rope. I mean, it's one tough plant. <laughs> so, so I, th I think uh, uh, hemp will probably have pretty good tolerance to defoliation. And um, I think there's good research questions associated with it. And th these should be things we should be looking at. Like, what's the relationship between leaf loss, defoliation, and yield? I mean, that's a pretty standard kind of thing you should do with any crop if you've got defoliators associated with it, uh, either for hail damage purposes or for insect defoliators. But the other separate thing is we pr should probably also be looking at do, uh, uh, these injuries induce chem uh, changes in uh, levels of CBD or, or THC. You know, it, you know, might maybe theoretically, I don't know why it would, but theoretically it could uh, with low level of, of 
defoliation that might jack up the THC level, say, and then make it a, a hot crop that you have to then discard. Anyway, those are things that should be looked at. So I think, uh, you know, artificial defoliation experiments should be able to get a handle on that. Those should be done. As for stem borers, um, the only, the, back, back in World War II, the only thing I could, ever, I could find, you know, when they were talking about growing hemp uh, during, during the war, that was considered an insect pest at that time, and it was grown here and, and grown in Iowa and uh, Indiana and the like at that time, was European corn borer. Um, now, I have yet to see European corn borer in, in Colorado and hemp, but it, because it comes in right to the very edge, I haven't checked that part, kind of into Nebraska, uh, we do get some corn borer, but you, you're corn borer country, so you'll probably get, you probably see corn borer in your hemp. But the one, the one that I think is um, one to watch is uh, one, something called Eurasian hemp borer. Tiny little moth, same genus as the oriental fruit moth, if any of you have ever worked with that. It's, it's not a big moth. And uh, it surprised me to find it in Colorado because there'd been no previous records that it had occurred anywhere near our area of the country, but it is uh, well known to be in, in this part of the, 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 the country right now. Caterpillars develop in small stems. Uh, the caterpillars also develop in the seed heads, and I think that might be the most uh, damage uh, where they get into the developing seeds. So I have, I've never seen this yet, and we have only, I, I've seen the insect in Colorado. I've never seen the damage to the heads, but I, I did hear a uh, report from uh, Indiana of, of somebody saying all these little tiny orange worms were in the heads of the, uh, in the, the hemp, in the heads, hemp seed head. And uh, that sounds like Eurasian hemp borer to me. So anyway, this is one to watch. I don't know how this is going to develop. Um, so we don't get it west of, of the, you know, but host range includes hops. It, uh, uh, who knows what else it, it has too, but uh, it does have hops and uh, cannabis. Um, and then there's all these weird things that are associated with ooze and stems and stuff. These are just novelty things. So, so you have these amazing June beetles. You got great green June giant uh, green June beetles here. So that's a, a Kentucky picture. Uh, we've got uh, bumble flower beetles, which I think you do too, and various kinds of flies. This little bicifera demandata I see very commonly in uh, hemp fields, but they're just ooze feeders. You might see a whole bunch you know, on a, on a branch that's been broken or where there's some, uh, it's, been, it's oozing from bacterial infection or something like that. Okay, so those are just novelties, but uh, you know, growers look at something like that and you go, oh my God, what do I got? So, I mean, I think, I think what we need to do is describe everything and explain everything that we got in the crop and the growers can then figure out how much to worry about or not once they, they know what they are. Uh, several hemipterans, uh, so now we're getting into the flowers and the developing seeds. There are several hemipterans that are gonna be feeding in the flowers and seeds. We've got, we've got at least four species of stink bugs that we've recovered. Uh, two, maybe three species of ligus. Um, those are you know, well-known groups of insects that feed on seeds. Uh, false chinch bugs, I think it's more of a Western thing, I think, but uh, that's a uh, Nicaeus uh, species. And then this one, Highland grass bug. That one, that one, I'd, I'd never really noticed it uh, in, in Colorado. It's, it's got a very wide host range, and I saw it building very high numbers on developing flowers and seeds late in the season in a crop that had been two years in a row hemp. Um, so this was not a, a known host for, uh, this insect, by the way, it does it develops on lots of things except grasses. So it's got a terrible common name, which we've got to fix, I think. But um, but it feeds on very many plants. So this might be one that might build up with continuous culture that you didn't have. So we might see more of that, and you definitely have these as well. So the question for the seed feeding bugs, you know, I, I, so so you have these these insects. We know these groups of of insects, uh, the stink bugs and the plant bugs and, and the seed bugs, uh, you know, feed on seeds. And so they're going to feed on seeds and flowers. Um, potential damage that they would do is cause seed abortion or damage seed. Uh, so they may not germinate or, or something. They may be pitted. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if they do that or not. And is this damage significant? I mean, this, this is a crop that produces a lot of seeds. This is so, so basic work has to be done just to put, figure out are these damaging seeds. I mean, they're on the seeds, they're feeding on the seeds, but do we care or not? And, and of course, you know, is you've got uh, brown marmorated stink bug, you know, you're going to add hemp to the long list of the favorite hosts of this insect. Who knows? Anyway, but 
it's another stink bug you've got. So, um, but then, then even if we do find that they feed on seeds, yeah, what are we going to do about it? So, I mean, because we can't spray insecticides on this crop because when they're feeding on seeds, there's tons of bees in there. Uh, we're going to have to get selective insecticides that can take out a take out a stink bug and not kill bees. What I don't know what that's going to be. Um, anyway, but let's hope they don't hurt the crop. They're just there as part of the, the fauna. But this this hemp coming back to this hemp russet mite. So this is one I you know again I was blithely saying ah oh, yeah you see it in, indoors and it's not going to be a problem outdoors. But uh, in the last two times I, I gave this talk in Colorado, people came up to me afterwards and said no, this hemp russet mite was really damaging to us. Uh, it came in late in the season, uh, near harvest. It was on CBD crops where they're growing buds, uh, all female plants and. Uh, uh, it it uh, came roaring uh, onto the plants in, uh, from late September into October. And um, so, so explosions late in the season, uh, these had serious uh, yield effects on the quality, um, feeding on those, those developing uh, uh, buds that are so oil rich that is the, the main thing we're trying to harvest. So th there are a couple, is there an aerified mite doctor in the house? I mean, we, we need, there's not very many around. We need somebody to work on this. And, and you know, answer questions like, is cannabis the only host plant for hemp russet mite? There's some things that people are telling me about the way it's working. I think it's gotta be spending part of its life cycle on some other plant. How long can it survive off the plant? What natural enemies are important uh, in managing it? Does the stickiness of the bud live, limit these natural enemies? So I think part of the reason we see it roaring onto the plants late in the season, one, is that most many of the natural enemies have, have taken a hike for the year. They've gone, they've gone dormant uh, when they, and these things take off. And then uh, these, these buds are really sticky. You know, maybe, maybe they're so sticky uh, a, uh, a potential predator can't, uh, can't manage the crop. I don't know. But the big, the big pest, the one that has caused definitely the most damage on, on hemp in our state is corn earworm, this ubiquitous insect. I mean, you know, this is an insect that is, is so, has such a wide host range, it's the only insect that has a, an approved ESA common, has three approved ESA common names. The only insect, this is a good Linnaean game question. Um, you know, uh, it's known as the corn earworm on corn, it's known as the tomato fruit worm on tomatoes and peppers, it's known as the bollworm, not the cotton bollworm, bollworm, get that right, they said that wrong once on ES Linnaean games, but anyway. Um, but anyway, and in, in, in hemp, you know, it's, you know, it's like everything, it's it, every other crop, it shows a lot of variation, you know, it could be pink, it could be black, uh, could be green, and, uh, uh, it, in, in 2016, in eastern Colorado, we had serious problems, uh, some serious damage. Uh, one grower told me, I mean, it's anecdotal, but he says he lost a half million dollars to this insect uh, uh, because they were boring into the buds of the head late in the season just before he was trying to harvest it. Now, at that point in time, the crop was worth a lot more than it is now. The price is tanked uh, as we get more and more people growing this. Anyway, we do have uh, fact sheets on this, and, and every I'm, I'm trying to develop fact sheets for every insect I find on hemp that we put up in our hemp insect website. And for this insect, we do uh, are proposing a, a pest management plan uh, for, for corn earworm, which is pretty much just uh, taking the, the corn earworm management plan for sweet corn and modifying it for, for this situation. So uh, using pheromone traps, Establish a program to monitor flights of the corn earworms using pheromone traps, and I'm suggesting they get it at least by midsummer uh, to establish some kind of baseline and checking them twice a week using the standard Heliothus traps uh, for this insect. Uh, and uh, if very high numbers are seen, coincident with taunt periods when uh, the crop is in a susceptible state, which would be the, the uh, September and going into maturity, then we treat. And uh, we have uh, two products in Colorado that we could use that I think are most likely to work on corn earworm. The Azawi uh, strain of, of BT is what I recommend because that's supposed to be a little better than the Kerstaki strain on cutworm type of, of caterpillars. And then there's a, uh, uh, a virus that are sold. These are, these are the products that uh, we'd be recommending. And these are Colorado allowed insecticides. And I'll come back to that in just a sec uh, that can be used to control corn earworm and hemp. We do have insecticides we can use in our state. 
The other thing uh, mentioning to, to growers is maybe uh, corn next to hemp, it might not be a good idea if, if corn earworm is a potential problem because uh, corn would be the biggest source of corn earworm of the previous generation before it moves into hemp. Uh, so it develops in corn uh, during midsummer and then they fly in September and that's when hemp becomes susceptible. So anyway, but then uh, just uh, finishing up one other thing, the, the other thing I want to mention is this potential value of hemp as a pollen resource of bees in agricultural areas. As I, as I alluded to earlier, it, it, it is astonishing how many bees are in some of these fields. I have never seen any crop that had so much bee action. Now again, you've got lots of flowering plants. You know, you've got you've got rain. Um, uh, uh, and in August, there might be something else that's flowering that's not irrigated. But uh, in in these agricultural areas where we are, there's it, there's not. And and they are just total magnets. I mean, they've got the honeybee and they've got bumblebees and many solitary bees and everything. So, I mean, actually, this may be another part where hemp fits in in some systems as a as a late season pollen source highly favored pollen source um, now the kind of hemp we're talking about determines whether it's going to be a, a, a pollen source the, the ones that would be a pollen source or if we're growing it for seed or fiber because usually they have they're producing seed because then you have flowers in those if you're growing it for cbd most of them aren't they're female plants they got no male flowers so cbd hemp is worthless for bees uh, but um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, ones that produce male flowers could be wonderful. It could be kind of fit in for, I don't know, if you need a, a late season uh, pollen source, hemp, hemp could be part of the, the, uh, the solution there. And, you know, the question comes up is, you know, is this good high quality pollen to bees? I mean, to figure it out, I don't know, that, should, that shouldn't be too hard to figure out. Put a pollen trap out and next to a, you know, a, a beehive next to a, a, a hemp field and collect the pollen and see if that's a high quality pollen or not. I mean, they're, they're bringing it back in buckets. They are not bringing back honey. Yeah, so this is, this is illegal to do this. This is, this is hemp infused honey. And that's, that's, a, that's an adulterated product. So uh, I hope we don't see Kentucky hemp honey. Uh, we shouldn't see Colorado hemp honey, but yeah, there's no nectar in this crop, it's just pollen. And pollinators, you know, as I've alluded to, can complicate uh, the uh, use of pesticides or insecticides if we have, a, have an insect control problem. Now, fortunately, the products that we are recommending for corn earworm, the 2BT, the, the BT product and the, the uh, Heliothus virus um, are quite compatible with bees. So I don't think we have a conflict there. So, this gets into pesticides. You know, the, the question comes up, you know, I, I, are there any pesticides labeled for hemp? And that's the, the pesticide conundrum with cannabis. You know, all registered pesticides can only be legally applied to a site, a crop on which they are labeled, you know, which, which you can read the label. It indicates that it can be used on that site. And presently, the agency that oversees uh, pesticide labeling, the EPA, does not recognize cannabis as a site. I mean, they won't say no it, they're not they're, they, it is not an oil seed crop it is not a you know herb it's not no we're not going to touch it it's still really it's still um it's still under discussion in the department of justice and with uh, our current attorney general i don't think that's going to move much in a long time but are there pesticides that can be used in this crop now and uh in some states there are and just a, a just briefly you know, what we've gone through and, and some other states have gone through is uh uh, a couple phases in this whole pesticide issue on cannabis crops, marijuana or, or hemp. And phase one is what I, I call the Wild West phase. And that, that existed uh, uh, early on uh, up until in our state about 2014. In the Wild West phase, you have some kind of cannabis crop, be it marijuana, be it hemp, whatever. But all registered pesticides are illegal. Uh, pesticide regulation and enforcement is ignored by state and federal agencies. They don't want to have anything to do with the crop. They don't want to to make any decisions about the crop, they don't want to look at the crop. The growers are the growers are totally unaware of, of pesticide laws or ignore them in the absence of any direction. And all pest management and information sources devolve to the internet and hearsay. And that's a bad place to be. And that's where where, where we were. I mean, people were where we were up until 2014. Um, because there was no direction and people were just you go on the internet. I, mean, I should have shown you a bunch of stuff I get on the internet back then. And, I mean, people were using everything. 
because they didn't know any better. Nobody was telling them because nobody wanted to take direction. So in the absence of federal oversight, the feds aren't doing it. So the states have to do it, which the feds should be doing it, but they're not. So the states are doing it. So now we're in what I think I call the state finesse phase. And Washington state was the first one to do this, where uh, Washington uh, came up with a list of pesticides that they allow on use on cannabis crops of all kinds, hemp, marijuana, all kinds. Um, and there are certain kinds of uh, requirements on this. And, and uh, um, in this, and I'll go, go through this and how we do it in our state in just a sec. So in the state finesse phase, some pesticides are identified by state agencies as being allowable. And, uh, and there is this uneasy alliance, you know, where, where the state is saying it's allowable, the feds are looking the other way, say, yeah, maybe, you know, we, we, don't, we still don't want to even touch this. The feds are still out of it. And uh, uh, pest management information sources are provided, uh, only minimal source, but uh, with support by state and local agencies still. But at least we have this, this um, uh, first step. So in our state, like uh, uh, fo we followed um, 18 months after Washington did it, Colorado did the same thing. So we, ha in our, our state, the Colorado Department of Agriculture maintains a website of pesticides that can be applied to hemp grown within the state. Not all states have done this, and I don't think Kentucky's done this. Um, and basically what is allowed, with the criteria for, for a pesticide to be used in Colorado, uh, one of the things would be if, you're, if it's a 25B minimum risk product uh, that are exempt from federal registration, and it's labeled in the state, uh, people allow, it's allowed. It has to be allowed, it has to be labeled in the state though. Um, but if it's a section th uh, three uh, product, the active ingredient has to be exempt from requirements of food crop tolerance. So nope, it has to be, we're talking soaps, oils, stuff like that. No food crop tolerance required. Some pesticides have that and others. But key is the label has directions for use on unspecified food crops, including unspecified food crops grown from bedding plants. But, but the, this is critical. The label has to be written kind of really loosely. If it's written really tightly and says you can use it on this, this, and this, you can't, and, and, and hemp is not on that label, you can't, it's not allowed in our state. But if it says, they love, I love these labels, you know, crops including but not limited to, then the state interprets it as being allowable. So it's, it's not not allowable. Um, uh, so it's allowable. So, and so this is the way, this is the finesse, that the, the way states have done it. Uh, we also re require that anything be EPA and CDA registered uh, to be on the Colorado list. And I don't agree with this, but uh, it has to be registered on tobacco. The idea here being that some of the, these are inhaled crops. Uh, some CBD is inhaled, marijuana certainly is. Uh, so they, they did this, but this, this, I don't. So this means like, you know, BTI, Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis, you put in the soil. It's, it doesn't have a tobacco crop, you can't use it anyway. So I think that was a little overreach personally. But anyway, we have what we have and, uh, Colorado Department maintains a website of these pesticides. You go to their site and you, know, you can get a, they change it, you know, as new products are reviewed and say, yes, this goes in. Oh no, that gets kicked back out now. But usually they're adding a few here, another oil product, another neem product. I mean, they're you know, pretty much nothing, nothing basic. We, we know the active ingredients we have to work with. And, and, and they, you get these lists like this. You know, again, Washington did that, we do it. I think California's doing it. You need to do that. Now, ultimately, you know, we'll get to the normalization phase. Someday, this, crop, this will grow up as a crop. It'll be accepted by the feds and uh, uh, addressed by federal laws and regulations of other crops. How will the pesticides issue be, be work out then? And it will it, vary depending on what kind of hemp we're talking about. I mean, I, I, I see us, uh, you know, if we're, we're talking about hemp that's being grown in the classic sense, you're trying to grow it for fiber or for seed, I mean, I, I think we could probably get some, some good pesticides. The ones that you really need, by the way, are herbicides. Forget insecticide, but could probably get uh, 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 some herbicides if they would make that decision. Call it another oil seed crop, you know? What's, what's labeled for sunflower? Same thing, just put in that crop 20 oil seed crop category. And if it's a fiber crop, probably even more loose uh, in terms of ability to get uh, some things interpreted as, or, or, or moved on to being registered. But CBD is what everybody's growing, and that's, that's different. This poses serious registration problems that I, I don't think, I, I think will preclude, 
preclude us from from having uh, uh, anything new registered on the on, on CBD crop for a long time. There's got to be a lot of studies done uh, on that because it's inhaled, it's ingested, you know, it's it's extracted. The products are extracted. All of these things have to be looked at in the kind of basic studies you do in order to allow uh, any kind of pesticide to be registered. Um, and that's going to cost a ton of money. So you know, this this produces an extracted product is consumed by humans uh, in different manners, as I just said, ingested, inhaled. These are all different uh, uh, modes of entry that have to be investigated. And uh, the extraction methods will vary. Um, you know, if you're extracting with one compound, are you pulling out the residues of the insecticide along with it or, or not? Okay, so um, I, di I did mention, uh, uh, you know, if you, the stuff that we are developing, I, we've got this hemp insect website, um, Presently, it's doing a makeover, so it'd be a little, you know, maybe check in a month. But anyway, you can see what we got so far if you want to go there and just do Hemp Insect website. I think it's the only one so far. But uh, uh, anyway, um, and that's that's it for general stuff. So any, any kind of questions? Or... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But this also really struck by how much overlap there is in a lot of the other pests with other crops that yeah. have high value. And so being super naive about the economics and the political aspects of growing this, and like, I don't know if you have a good understanding of relative practices of this and other crops, but wondering what your thoughts are on what capabilities you think of to track crops. I don't know. I, I'm, I, I don't know. Um, not sure what it would be. I mean, it, it, we'll have to. I mean, we'll have to see if it's how 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 much more uh, attractive it is to to something, something uh, uh, to, to other crops in, in field situation. I don't know. Uh, it's it's growing. It's it's small early in the season. It doesn't really get much size until August September. So that's when it would be really sucking stuff in, and that's getting toward the end of the growing season. I don't know. I, I, um, For using this as a, as a trap crop, um, well, the uh, um, right now it's still people are still trying to figure out how to grow this, and uh, there are some problems. I mean, there's germination problems. Some of the seed loss have got pet, so you know, it's so it's not a, a given. I think that's all going to be figured out over the next few years as as we develop it with agronomics. So so that would make it easier to grow, but. In terms of a trap crop, I mean the reverse. You know, one of the things that I I would be recommending is is the reverse. I mean, I say grow some corn to to, a, to attract the corn earworm next year. You know, some late season sweet corn make make the corn earworm go into that instead of your hemp crop. So it's not the reverse, but uh, I haven't thought about it. You know, hemp going to other other producing insects for other other plants. But, um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, Dan. Yeah. Yes, it's in our constitution. You can't, and it, 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 it we can't because. Because we, because our 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 uh, our, uh, um, our our institution accepts federal money, and the lawyers at CSU said we cannot, absolutely cannot work in marijuana, absolutely, and we can work on hemp because of the farm bill. They did this whole questions and answers about it, so we can do that, um, but we can't work on marijuana. It drives me nuts. It drives me nuts as an extension guy, working on. I mean, so so this is the story. I just told the story to somebody else today, but you know so so. I, I went into, I, I did a, a, a visit to a, a marijuana grow once, uh, and I always have to take the day off. I'm on annual leave. I have nothing to do with CSU when I visit a marijuana facility. Um, uh, and I, I emailed them through my home email. It never goes through a CSU email. 
It's all quickly separated. But anyway, I went to this one guy. This guy uh, said he was having some plants that weren't looking so good. I actually brought a plant pathologist in the, um, and we solved the problem. He says that these plants aren't doing that well. Uh, they're a little, they're not yielding as well. Some of our plants, are, and, and uh, turns out it was a pythium problem. These things are, are grown from, from cuttings and, and the way they're doing it, they're getting infected as they did the cuttings and the plants were, you know, had root rot and they weren't. So, so and this plant was 30% yield loss, the guy estimated. Okay, well, could you tell me how much you know, this plant is worth? And he says, well, I don't know, 500, 700 bucks. One plant. I'm in a plant of. A, I'm in a room of a thousand plants. 150 ducks times a thousand. I mean, if I could tell him how to deal with pythium, I would save him more money than you know all the extension recommendations I've done that year for everything else um, in terms of value to, to growers. It drives me nuts that I can't talk about it. So I you know I do some of the side. I've got a little pest management of indoor. Now I can say it's indoor grown hemp because we've got most of the same kinds of things, but. No, it's uh, it drives me nuts. But yeah, it could make so much progress so fast if we could talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Indoor grown. In, yeah, a lot. Yeah, it would. So I can I can grow them for CBD. I can say you know you're you're growing. You've got a mother plant. You're growing cuttings. You know you got thrips on your plants. You got two spotted spider mite on your plant. I can tell you how to do that for CBD. But I can't if you're growing the same thing for marijuana. Yeah because that's against the law. Anyway, so, yeah. Do, do I think it's the same here? Yeah, you think it would be the same as if it were to come to you? Uh, do I think that you'd not be able to work on marijuana? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think your lawyers would come to the same conclusion all the you know, lawyers elsewhere have that, yeah, a, a state university accepting federal money cannot engage in something that is still considered to be illegal under federal law. Yeah, yeah, no, research is being done, you know, by private individuals, some of which know what they're doing and some of them don't. And, or they go to the internet and, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, there's there's one, it's I don't outdoors. There there's one uh, aphidious something. I I don't know what it is, but it's not too common. But um, I do see fungi, and I'll bet you get way more fungi than we do because you got better moisture. Um, but no, not not too many. It's mostly predators. But you know, it's still early. I mean, it's you know, it's, these are fields that you know hemp had just grown there. That's the first year, or only the second year it's been there. So so you know, over time, yes, yeah, I think we'll see things, uh, natural enemies specific to cannabis aphid or some of these other things also developing, but we're, we're in early stages. It's gonna be fun to see how this all develops. Yeah. No, and that, that's, a, that's a question that comes up, you know, because cannabis aphid is, you know, an aphid and aphids can transmit virus diseases and there's, there's virus diseases in, in hemp, and, um, but nobody really knows what they are. My argument, my, I, I've been saying, yeah, there's all these virus diseases, and now we have cannabis aphid, but we didn't have cannabis aphid before, and since only aphid, the aphid-transmitted viruses can only be transmitted by aphids, and we didn't have aphids before, all the viruses we have are not aphid-transmitted viruses. So, you know, I, 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 I would tend to say, no, there's no benefit to control aphids to control viruses, because we don't know there's any aphid-transmitted viruses. It's all mechanically transmitted viruses. So. Maybe, I, mean, I haven't even seen uh, tomato spotted wilt. Shoot, I, I, maybe this is a one plant that that doesn't go to. Um, I don't know. Um, I thought that, that's, yeah. Uh-huh. But we've jacked up other ones. I mean, may, may, I mean, THC might not affect Japanese needle. Well, I mean, what I'm asking, what I'm asking is, I mean, if, if you've got a very low secondary chemical conversion, like an A secondary chemical, um, you can get a lot more drugs than that. You can get it for, you know, I know you can't research it, but if you had a 
deal marijuana in the deal, you think there'd be a lot less fraud? I don't know. I mean, the I mean, the only the only paper I know that anybody's looked at marijuana was a study. It's in Journal of Entomological Sciences, uh, done in Mississippi, which is where the federal facility for growing marijuana has been. In this, of all places, um, the uh, uh, that's where they've been growing it. And and uh, yeah, he found a I, I don't know like forty different species of plant feeders on it. I mean, none no cannabis aphid, but found a lot of other stuff. But you know, no indication of you know if there's lots of them. You know, there's lots of stuff that's low level. So I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, what are the secondary compounds? I mean, there's no reason for us to think that CBD or THC has effect on insects just because it makes us go crazy. Uh, yeah. What? Yeah, but I don't know. All alkaloids aren't created equal. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't. Know. Yeah, or may, maybe at one time, but I mean, these, these are highly inbred plants that, you know, maybe don't resemble the original plant at all. I mean, the original plant may have had really low levels. People have been breeding them over eons. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I think it's mostly the CBD comp compounds in that. It's, um, I don't know, it's just really gooey. So, I mean, I, I would, I would think so, including predators and, and, and an aerified mite. I mean, they could just, aerified mites probably go right through that because they're so tiny, tiny, tiny. So, I don't know. Yeah, I don't have a lot of answers. I'm just showing you what I saw so far. I want you to go and look what you got. Yeah, because, because again, I think, uh, you know, it, it, I think we'll have a lot of overlap, and uh, um, uh, but there will be some things different because you know the way we, we're in a drier climate. You're going to have more diseases, plant disease, plant pathogens on leaves. You're going to in Kentucky there'll be more plant pathogens than we have in Colorado. But insects, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Oh, indoors for marijuana, it's huge. Huge industry. Oh yeah, they're using tons of predatory mites for control two spotted spider mite. Uh, that's that'd be the big thing. And there's I, uh, there's supposed to be one that's fairly good on hemp russet mite. It's recommended, but that that's heavy use uh, right now of, of predator mites for spider mite control. That's that's the key pest. And now cannabis aphid. Cannabis aphid does seem to be working its way around the country. I mean, so I. I um, you know, Oregon just reported it, and I, I I don't know how long it's been in the United States, but it's certainly it's it's very common now in Colorado, and and uh, so then we'll have that will be biocontrols will be introduced for that probably certain parasitic wasps, uh, certain I don't know what aphidia species.